Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode number 60. If you're a first-time listener, welcome. And if you're a returning listener, thank you so much for coming back. If you'd like more information about the podcast, previous guests, want to catch up on previous episodes, or just want to drop me a line, it's all at the website DesertLadyDiaries.com. And I invite you to engage with me on social media, Facebook and Instagram, at Desert Lady Diaries, and on Twitter, at Desert Lady Diary. Vanessa Zendejas is an artist who came to the desert to work for another artist. Originally from Chicago, Vanessa maintains an art studio in L.A. and has reduced her twice-weekly commute from L.A. to a twice-monthly commute, and she'll have more time for her own art once her desert studio is complete. I'm here today with Vanessa Sendejas. She is an artist living in 29 Palms, originally from Chicago, where she went to the School of the Art Institute for Painting and later attended Bard College for an MFA in sculpture. Although she still spends time in LA, she has lived in the high desert for the past four years where she works for Andrea Zetel and High Desert Test Sites. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. What was your first experience with the desert? I came out once the first year that I moved to L.A. for a weekend trip with friends. It was really short and I didn't really, I didn't, I mean, I really enjoyed it, but I didn't, I didn't think too much or deeply about it. And then about a year later, Andrea invited me out to do a job interview and I came out and was like, okay, yeah, I'm totally going to get into this. And I started working for her three days a week. And I would come out from L.A. on the first day and I would stay here. She had a little private cabin sort of for me on her land that I could stay on. Nice. Work for three days and I would go back to L.A. every week for a couple years. Yeah. Wow. How many years did that go on before you actually moved? Two and a half. But (laughs) it's also sort of... I mean, I still go back to L.A. I used to go back once a week for several years. And then just in the last, like, two years, do I just go back twice a month? Okay. So at what point during this job Mm -hmm. did you decide, you know what? I think I'm just going to Mm -hmm. live out there permanently. It was probably, like, two years in. I had, I don't know, I'd gone through, like, a bad breakup and... My boyfriend at the time left L.A., and it was really hard to live on my own, Mm -hmm. and L.A. was becoming really, really expensive. The job with Andrea was working out really well, so I kind of felt like it made sense in a lot of different ways to just live out here, and I kept my art studio in L.A., and I still have it, so I go back regularly and can kind of have a base there without having an apartment. Right. That's great. Where in L.A. is your studio? It's in Glass Hill Park. Oh, okay. Nice. Mm-hmm. That's a nice place. Mm-hmm. I lived in uh, Atwater for the first two years that I lived in L.A. I lived in Atwater for the year that I was sort of on my own. I had like a little apartment. There. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I loved Atwater. Me too. So let's back up a little bit to Chicago. hmm And what was it that made you go into art? I just always did art and I was good at it. I used to take weekend classes at the museum when I was in high school and my dad also used to do that and my dad used to also take me to his classes with him when I was really little. So it was just something I was always around and I became good at and when my parents saw that I was I was not bad, <laughs> I took it seriously, <laughs> they supported my decision to go to art school. I just kind of did it because that's what I knew I I had to do. Right. Yeah. Did you try a number of different disciplines or mediums that you said, ah, this isn't for me, or something else resonated a lot more than others? Painting was always my thing, but I did try a few other things. I did a bunch of photography, but I never really... I never really strayed far from painting. That was my focus the entire time I was there. Right. And are you a landscape painter? Are you a portrait painter? Are you a... I did a lot of figure painting in school, but at the end I was focused on making abstract paintings and works on paper. Hmm. I've always looked at abstract and thought, where does that come from? What is it? Is it feelings? Is it just imagination? Is it um, color 
combinations? Can you describe how you come up with your concepts? Or... Yeah. So the school that I was at, the people who were teaching in the painting department at the time were of a group of artists called the, the Chicago Imagists or the Harry Who. And so they were older by the time I was in school, but they were really active in the 60s and the 70s. They were dedicated to abstraction. So the way that they taught abstraction is sort of still how I think of it. And that, that there are sort of these rules or these ways of thinking through making abstraction that it should not just rely on this like feeling or imagination that it should be rooted in these in these concepts and challenges. We used to work on all these different exercises that would sort of highlight the different vocabulary involved with abstraction. Mm. Like understand when you're when you're making a mark that is a stylization versus an abstract mark and then like what the sort of quality of those lines and marks sort of how it feeds into how it looks and how it resonates. And so it was a, it was like a challenging way of thinking through it and they generally asked you to challenge yourself a lot mm. when you made things. So instead of just kind of like in a Kandinsky-esque moment just sort of try to throw out these marks that your subconscious maybe has make those marks maybe and then actually try to connect them in a way that create new form and don't mm -hmm. just mimic something that you see so i don't know if that makes total yeah. sense <laughs> but well it, it gives me a lot more to go on than i've ever had before <laughs> you know not having been a student of art yeah. per se i enjoy viewing it but always wonder underneath like so where did that come from, essentially, yeah. right? In the abstract works that I've made over the last like few years, I try to lift line and form that I find interesting and unexpected in a real life setting mm -hmm. and sort of transpose it into a work on paper or a sculpture mm -hmm. and continue to absorb different sort of line and objects that I see that I think are abnormal or different or mm -hmm. atypical and just try to find a way that they can create new form on a piece of paper or in a sculpture. And I don't know, I like looking for tiny moments in life, I guess. Interesting that you would move to the desert that I would imagine has a lot of lines and shapes and things that are different and not what people would consider normal. I don't know. Yeah. Um, has that influenced your work now since you've been here for, what, six years? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, the mm -hmm. landscape for sure is is always a nice source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. But other things aside from the landscapes that are really great here are, I mean, just going to even the swamp meet or, uh, you know, seeing what other artists do out here. One of my favorite places is Desert Christ Park. I really like the sort of total abnormality of those hair forms, like the hair on his forms. <laughs> right. Kind well, of... and most of the, I'll call them statues, yeah. they're five or six or more times the size of yeah. an average human body, yeah. which is really wild mm -hmm. to begin with. It's a really interesting place. Yeah. They're <laughs> weird sculptures. Yeah. And I really enjoy them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And Desert Christ Park is in Yucca Valley. Mm -hmm. If they were looking to visit that or look it up online, maybe I'll actually put a link in the show notes to it so people yeah. can see it. And I know that they're also looking for donations because they're doing a lot of refurbishing up they there. Mm -hmm. So that's great. I like to go to the swap meet and I don't like to go to the swap meet. Mm -hmm. I don't like to go to the swap meet because I just look at all that stuff and that junk and think about just all the waste that's there. Yeah. And then I flip it on its head and I go, but it makes her some really interesting... I like to go there and take pictures Yeah. of all the different trinkets that people have on the tables. Or maybe they have some old Barbie dolls or Barbie heads or vacuums from like 1920 and stuff like that. It's just, it's a really interesting amalgamation of stuff. 
Yeah. But it makes me feel bad. <laughs> I I get that feeling. Garbage is a really interesting thing out here. Mm-hmm. That's actually like I I've taken a lot of I don't know quick snapshots of garbage cuz okay so being from Chicago, garbage doesn't exist in the same way as it does out here because in Chicago there's mold. And mm. so everything decomposes if you leave it out. And right. it decomposes in a stinky, you know, Nasty way that way, yeah. you know, you have to really consolidate. In the desert, people just not everyone, but mm-hmm. people have, Right. There's a lot of it. <laughs> there's <laughs> there's many instances of just kind of garbage out in the desert. And the swap meet is similar where some of that stuff has been there for I don't even know how long you see right. this like layer of sand. And the way, and it's just that it can stay around for longer Mm -hmm. because of this totally different process. That is really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make me depressed. And I don't know why. I think I'm really just kind of into seeing like how culture sort of sets stuff aside. Mm, And like also what culture like absorbs and mm-hmm. and it's like a really interesting array of what people use exactly and it's, I guess that's part yeah. of um that was I think a large part of Noah Purifoy's work yeah too totally. was you know creating these structures and sculptures out of everyday items some of my favorite things are like the toilets I love the toilet or mosaics. the um yeah. <laughs> the uh electronic appliances like he's got VCRs and toaster ovens and mm-hmm. TVs and it's a big wall of it's so interesting to look at yeah and then to see how it's worn or not Mm-hmm. through the heat and the sunlight and everything else. So yeah. it's a pretty cool place. So why does one move from Chicago to L.A.? I had gotten to a point after college that I had been there my whole life and I wanted to go somewhere bigger. Mm-hmm. And it was kind of just as simple as that. And I, either I was going to move to New York or I was going to move to L.A., I chose L.A. I had some other close friends who were moving to L.A. We all kind of decided that New York was sort of maybe not, no longer the the place to have to move. We thought it was, we decided it was L.A. (laughs) (laughs) So did you do any like reconnaissance missions out to L.A. before you moved or did you just say, I'm just packing and going? I visited once just to confirm Mm. that that's what we were going to do or that that's what I was going to do. And then I just did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not much. I didn't really spend that much time (laughs) Right, it it. just went. (laughs) Yeah. And then when the job came up with Andrea, how did that all happen? I met her through a professor that I had at BART. And so BART is where I went to grad school and and then that was the other reason I didn't really feel like I had to move to New York is because I went to school there and Andrea had spent a lot of time in New York Mm -hmm. I don't remember how she knew the person that I knew but it was just Mm -hmm. through sort of artist contacts so then you come out to take this job did you know anybody else that was out here besides Andrea when you took this job Okay. No. (laughs) I guess traveling back and forth, there wasn't really a lot of time to spend in the community and make contacts. But once you were here living, how did that all happen? Was it just within the artist community that you started to get to know people in the area? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) one of the main ways it seems like a lot of artists out here know each other is actually through working for or knowing Andrea. (laughs) Really? So when I first started working for her, she employed, I think, two, three other people. And the staff shifts and it's usually between three and four people at a time. And so I first met the other people that I was working with. And then through them, I kind of met other artists that were out here who mm. had also worked for her in and out on a on a temporary basis, on a pro- by project basis. Mm-hmm. And then you know, as people that she knew came to visit, I kind of just slowly met more and more people out here. Mm-hmm. She's a really interesting figure because as as much as she's not very socially present in the community. She's really present. (laughs) And everyone 
knows her mm. through some way. Right. And she's actually a huge social connector out here. Oh. So it was pretty easy through the job to just kind of like meet everybody who was here. Right. And you guys do a lot of interesting projects with high desert test sites. Can we talk about that for just a little sure. bit? Mm-hmm. Because your position is the... Administrative administ- director. Okay. And what does that all entail exactly? I mostly just make sure that everything is running. I don't play a huge curatorial role. I do a little bit, but it's not my main, it's not my main job. For the most part, I'm making sure that all the programs are running that we're fundraising at the Mm. same time and trying to strategize some of those fundraising and project management. So High Desert Test Sites is a nonprofit that Andrea co-founded, I think in 2002. And she co-founded it with a few other people. And the goal has always been to incorporate more and insert more experimental artworks in the high desert. Mm. And that sort of ranges from sculptural installation to performances and we also like to say like intimate experiences. Being really conscious of our local community is a big part of it so we're not just trying to bring in outsider artists Mm -hmm. and just like make cool installations in the desert we're trying to also make sure that that artwork is of interest or needed mm. by the local community. Well, and a great way to do that is speaking of the swap meet, you guys have a kind of a little office and information mm-hmm. booth there at the swap meet. So yeah. anybody who comes and wants to know about high desert test sites and what's happening has a place to go. Yeah. Tell me about the sculpture that is kind of on the front lawn, if you will of the compound up there, which is amazing. I had the good fortune to go on a tour after Arts Connection conference last year. That was a lot of fun. But I think a lot of people probably drive by that. I mean, I was with somebody the other day that doesn't live out here. And we drove by, and he was like, "What are what's with the black rocks? What is that? And I go, that's an art installation from High Desert Essex. Can you talk a little bit about that for someone who's listening that may not, may drive by that and have the same question? Yeah, so that's the planar pavilions. It's actually an artwork by Andrea. And it's one of the only works by her that HDTS sort of stewards a bit. So the compound, Andrea's compound is AZ West. And for the most part, because she lives there, we don't really open it to the public. Right. We have tour dates. And can people find those on the High Desert Test Sites website? Okay. But she kind of always wanted to have a public sculpture component to the land and a few years ago she got a couple of grants she received a couple of grants to produce this large sculptural work on her land and to make it public she has this general theory in her work about panels and planes about simple rectilinear forms and that these simple rectilinear forms make up our lives entirely from plywood and sheetrock to towels Mm. and sheets that interesting everything is this rectilinear form this Mm. plane or panel and just kind of depending on how it's situated in your life is kind of how you respond to it so a really core form is the walls And so she'd been thinking a lot of walls as conceptual dividers. So the sculpture, Planar Pavilions, it's I think 10 of these sets of pavilions that are spread out over a 10 acre parcel. They are a series of walls and corners that you can walk through and they're all made of cinder blocks painted black. And it's kind of just an abstract way to kind of experience the landscape with this really normal thing that exists in our lives Mm. all the time, but in a different way. That's cool. So that's what those black things are on the highway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And (laughs) anyone can go experience those. You can pull up. There's little parking spots and you Mm -hmm. can walk through. I think if you take that right turn by the bail bonds Yep, and then left, Mm -hmm. and then you'll find it. Perfect. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And you have uh, Kip's Book Club, Mm -hmm. and we have had High Desert Test Kitchen. Linda Sibio, Mm -hmm. she's been on the podcast a little while back, and 
She has her, is it the Insanity Principle? Yeah, workshops. Workshops mm-hmm. that she does. So those are all things that are kind of, I guess, sponsored by or those programming that High Desert Test Sites yeah. does. And for the most part in all of those situations, those are projects that those artists developed themselves, came to us, and then we are just like, yeah, we'll totally support it as a monthly or as a regular program. And those regular programs are another really important way for us to sort of be present in Mm -hmm. our local community. As monthly programs, those programs are for our our Joshua Tree community. Right. Well, and they're they're very Mm -hmm. desert-focused. At least, well, Kip's with the books, they're always uh, some kind of desert focus, and Sarah with some kind of prickly pear or some other desert plant that we're turning into food or drink, which is super cool, so... Well, they are, all live here. So, and they all live here, right. You know, they're <laughs> sort of like working from their slash our third needs and agenda. Right. Yeah. So do you have a studio here for yourself as well as L.A.? Or is it only in L.A.? We're building one out in our new house. Oh, new studio. Great. <laughs> but um, I still have the one in L.A. It's been a little rough to figure out a good studio schedule with the back and forth. Sure. Absolutely. I was So that was my next question was, so with all of this that you're doing with your work, when is there time for Vanessa to create <laughs> art? That's been hard. I do thankfully only work for Andrea four days a week, so it's really that's kind of one of the most important things I think when you are a working artist mm. is not really working more than four days. It's kind of like your key. It can keep you alive and it can give you enough time in the studio. But with the back and forth, it's like a little hard, and I'm always trying to figure out a better schedule for myself. Right. So once the studio here is done... I can spend right. more time at night in there. Here. Right. Yeah, that'll be a better way to work. And do you have any projects in mind that you really want to get started or that you're in the midst of working on right now that you want to talk about? Ooh, I've been working more on ceramics these days because oh. we got a kiln at Andrea's studio, which... I've been able to use which is really nice so when you you know when you don't have ceramics facilities you can't really do it no and you need kind of would need to pay membership to a different ceramic studio to do it that can be hard for me with the back and forth and like knowing when I can even do that right so it's been really nice to actually sometimes be able to work on like a long weekend mm-hmm. on ceramics here and fire so that's sort of been my my reason and what kind of pieces are you making with your ceramics just small abstract sculptures I like calling them tabletop sculptures are they tall or wide or they're usually mm, not more than about a foot high Mm -hmm. and a foot wide, sometimes a little bit bigger, but I've kind of felt like they've been practice exercises, Mm. but because even though I went to school for sculpture, I didn't learn a lot about like technical skills in sculpture. (laughs) So I'm still like kind of working back through some of that stuff. So to Mm -hmm. work with clay has been really challenging because Mm. it's something that I never really formally learned how to do. So it's a challenge. Yeah, that's fun. Coming here to the desert, was there, were there any surprises or things that you weren't expecting when you got here and started really digging in and living full time? There's probably lots of things that <laughs> surprised me. <laughs> I don't really know what I... I don't really know what I expected, mm. honestly. I've never lived in a rural environment before. And I think I'm still, like, processing it. I still don't really know, like, what to walk away from it with. But, yeah, I think a lot of things surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> Can you think of one or two? incidents Um, maybe that happened or I guess like the I don't the social part of it I think was really surprising to me I mean it's a diverse community here but it's like diverse in such a different way than like a city and some of the sort of like uh the ways that people are out here you know there is like a I'm just going to say it. There's like a there's like a very like libertarian aspect of like this community. Mm-hmm. And like as someone from a very blue city, my grandmother was like a politician, like a democratic, you know, like lady politician. Mm-hmm. The libertarian aspect of this place really 
really threw me for a loop. <laughs> <laughs> and that's been maybe like the biggest challenge of sort of understanding this very different mm -hmm. way of looking at the world right. that I've never really thought much about before. And it's making me think about it and it, I don't find myself to be any more sympathetic with it than right. I was at the beginning. <laughs> but I'm at least thinking about it right. more. Well, and I think that's important, and not only because now we live side by side, mm -hmm. it just challenges to our assumptions, I suppose, yeah, in, totally. in a matter of speaking. So it makes us, I guess, a little more balanced, and hopefully the same works in reverse. Yeah. If that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's the best way to think of it. <laughs> and what are some of your favorite things to do out here now that you've, you know, been dug in for a little while? Are there some things that you find yourself doing um, that you really enjoy besides your art? The best things, that I think, are still, like, hiking. Mm -hmm. And um, Do you just, get in the park much to do we it? We don't go in the park because we have a dog. And so when you have a dog out here and that's, like, a lot of people you mm -hmm. don't actually go to the park that much because you can't bring your dog so we go to a lot of other spots that we can take her BLM land mm -hmm. and like other sort of like dog friendly like the preserves I happen um, to be in um I think I drove through I went out to breakfast in 29 and then we drove from the 29 entrance back to Joshua Tree mm -hmm. through the park and I was just the other day looking at the little newspaper they give you, which, P.S., the map in the paper is much better yeah. than the actual map that they hand you. Yeah. <laughs> There's a tip. But anyway, I happened to be looking at it the other day before I threw it away to see if there was anything going on. They're starting up new tours. And I noticed on several pages there were warnings about bringing oh, yeah. your dog into the park. And I think because people who don't live here in the desert that don't really understand the dangers to their pet of just even letting them off the leash yeah. in the park with snakes or other animals that might come after them. Mm -hmm. And in the evenings, if you bring them camping, we have coyotes that, you know, show up and look like they want to play with them, but really they just want to eat them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's really hard. Yeah. But are there certain trails that you can bring them on if, if they are leashed, or do you just not? In the park? Yeah. You know, I, I heard that there was a trail, maybe, that you okay. could bring them on leash, but I've never found it, or right. really, I guess, because it seems pretty off-limits. Off off-limits, off limits, yeah. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, like, right. we there's plenty of other places to go. Our little dog, she she's not scared, but... A lot of the dogs out here have become pretty used to all those crazy critters. At yeah, least. that's true. Yeah, because <laughs> at some point, I know I see often on the either the next door website yeah. or on Facebook, you know, either people are posting pictures of dogs that they've found yeah. wandering or someone saying, my dog got out yeah. and that sort of thing. So it, it's a pretty regular thing that happens out yes. here. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. When you were growing up in Chicago... Would you have ever imagined that you'd be living in the California desert? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got married out here, and when my mom came out the first time to help us plan the wedding, that was the first thing she told my partner. She was like, if you'd have told me <laughs> that my daughter would be living in the middle of the desert, I would not have believed you. <laughs> Yeah. And do you think it's a place that you'll stay? Um, not like a full time. I don't, I mean, I'm, we're here pretty much full time now and we really like it. But both my husband and I are not from here. He's from Montreal. Mm -hmm. And we really, I think, just miss the East Coast and the Midwest. Gotcha. Um, so... I think we would always keep our place here mm -hmm. and we love our house and we love being here but I think that given our our family situations that we would just kind of need to part-time it at some point but it's really like everyone has their own balance that they have to figure out here and I really respect folks who full-time it mm. like all the way yeah but given that we both have, like, this other part inside of us and, like, family that still lives there, I think we have to kind of 
kind of go back to that a little bit. Right. And this will always be here as a respite when you need yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Don. Thanks so much for listening to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you heard something that inspired or enlightened you, I'd love to hear about it. Send an email to desertladydiaries at gmail.com or start a discussion on the Desert Lady Diaries Facebook page. Next week, Rinda Laurel will talk about her work in the music industry, her move to the desert, and how her life and recovery became the inspiration behind her new line of supplements. Thanks so much for listening.